Book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 20. Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 20. Are you comfortable? <clears throat> Ephesians 3, 20, 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Can you, you can't think. You can't ask more than God can bless you and do exceedingly abundantly above come on, come on. according to the power that works in us. It's an amazing verse when I'm reading this. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. It's prayer. Amen. Father, I love you. I thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, to make this house, the people of this house, effective for your glory. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Now open to 2 Kings chapter 6. You can be seated. You can be seated. I'm sorry. 2 Kings chapter 6. It's right after 1 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 6. A really cool set of scripture here. Exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think. Say it with me. Exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think. Over 40 years ago, I gave my life to Jesus. And the big strive inside of me is to be effective for the king. I just want to be effective. I just want to do the things that, that Jesus would want me to do. 2 Kings 6, 1 says, the company of the prophets, or the sons of the prophets. It's a group. It's a, it's a man band. Yeah, it's a, it's a band of men known as the sons of the prophets. They, and they gathered, and they studied the word of God, and they prayed, and they listened to the word of God, and they, they had prophetic unction about the future and seeing the future. Well, they began to really grow. And as they grew as a group, they said to Elisha, and Elisha is the, is the one after Elijah, the double portion man, the double portion of, mi of miracles. They said, look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to live. And he said, go. Now, understanding the, the, the pole, the sticks, what they would do is build just like a log cabin. They would build out and build it up. But it was too small. And the blessings of my life is I have been in buildings that were too small. You know, we're starting out in a house for a church and then moving to a, a motel. And, and it was too small. And then to an auction barn. And it was too small. And then to a, a large barn. And it was too small and then ended up out at the camp into a little chapel and we built it out and it was too small and then we went to another building and built it out and it was too small and then we bought this well we came over here into a funeral home for two years and it got too small and then we bought this place and one day I pray I stand here and it's too small come on, come on. okay get an amen but when it gets too small, then you get constricted. It, you got to do something. You got there's something got to happen. It was their request. Let us go. We pray unto the Jordan. Take every man a beam. One scripture says, make a place here. You know, let us move from here to there. Why would you do that? You move because you're uncomfortable. Some of you in homes. Some of you are in homes that are too big, and you need to move into something smaller. Come on. Amen. Sometimes I see folk living in way too big a house for just a couple of people. And I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm just telling you that's a lot to take care of. Uh, sometimes I want to have a little regress in my life and just make sure that I can be in a place I can clean. Mm -hmm. Amen. Unless you can afford to have somebody do it for you. All right. So we're uncomfortable. We want something different. We want more room. We want change. So they requested to move to the Jordan. Now, if you think about the Jordan River, that place at the Jordan, it's a place of transition, but not habitation. In other words, you could cross over it, but you didn't stay there. You moved on into the promised land. It was a place of change. It wasn't permanence. It was a place of transformation, but not position. It was a place of crossing, again, not living. It was a place for promotion, not instruction. They wanted out of tightness. Verse 3 says, then one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? In other words, you're the papa of the man band here. Why don't you come with us? It, Elisha said, I will. He went with them, and they went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head 
fell into the water. In other words, it got loose on the end of the stick or the end of the handle, and it flew off in the water. And the man yelled, oh, my Lord, he cried. It was borrowed. I mean, no, it's tough when you lose something. It's worse when it's, Amen. that's right, especially when you draw attention to it. My advice is if you lose something that's borrowed, hush. <laughs> you know, it's funny, every year, every year, our church goes through this looking for chairs and tables. Every year, we're looking for our church tables and our church chairs. And, we, and, and so I actually went out and bought 300 used chairs last week. Amen. Just, just went and bought them. Got them for $2 a piece. I'm tired of renting them. Okay. So I went and bought them. I just said, can, can I buy? I just asked the guy straight up, can I just buy these chairs? And you guys? He said, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I said, how much? He said, two bucks. I said, well, I gave you 300 last week for these chairs. He said, we'll take that, add it to it. And you give us 300 more, you can have each other. Thank you, Lord. That gives people plenty of, of chairs to borrow. So then I asked Judy, our kitchen lady, I said, how many tables do we need? Because we used to have a full cafeteria of tables. She said, we need 12 tables to handle the camp we got coming in two weeks. Well, where did they, all the other tables go? I think they're sunk in the Jordan somewhere. <laughs> I think somehow they were borrowed and people have forgotten. Where did that white table come from? I'm not picking. I'm just inadvertently sharing with you. That if you have borrowed, <laughs> you ain't got to say nothing. Just bring it in the night and drop it off. <laughs> Slip on out. Last night, man, I'm, I'm sitting there, me and Jill, and I, I watched somebody come flying through the property on a four-wheeler. Just <laughs> Oh, my goodness. We got these kids. That it, I, I've been asking God to send she-bears out of the woods and maul them like Elisha did. You know, I just, or Elijah, whichever one of them Eve guys. Amen. But anyway, uh, so it come flying through, and I saw it, and you know what I, did? I ran out, and I shut the gate. I'll catch you this time. And I drove up. The other gate was open. So I drove up to the other gate and shut my lights off. I could see them running around on Baptist encampment on their four-wheeler. And I sat there with my lights off. And I knew they got to come right back through that gate. And as soon as they come through that gate, I stepped out in front of the truck. Now, I don't know what I'm fixing to face. You don't know. And they pull up, and there's three brand-new kids. They don't know. They're not like the other ones that need to be mauled by a bear. Hey, man, they're three brand new kids. And, and they looked at me, and I said, guys, look, you can't be driving through here at night on a four-wheeler. we got camp going on. You could get hurt here. There were three kids on one four-wheeler and a little bitty girl there in the middle, and she couldn't shut up. She talked. She said, we just, we, 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 we just rented this here, and it is so much fun. We're having so much fun. And she just, remind me of somebody else's little girl. I said, turn around, get off the property before you get hurt here. And they turned around and went back out. Amen. I just wanted to share that story. It has nothing to do with the sermon. <laughs> it was borrowed. The man of God asked. I, I've been saying it for years. I'm going to catch these kids doing it. You know, I, I hate catching them, but I, I'd rather them not come on there. The man of God asked, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. Elisha cut a stick, threw it there, made the iron float, he said, lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. The King James says it this way. And the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down the stick and cast it in, and the iron did swim. I love that statement, that the iron popped up from the water in the, in the, in the Jordan and began to rotate itself and come to shore to the man. It swam. Now you say, Pastor, that's crazy. It ain't no crazier than throwing a stick in and watching it pop up. So you might as well make the thing spin toward you. Amen. It swam toward you. You, you know, when I, I speak from experience when it comes to building. I've been involved in so many building projects, preparing for the harvest, the frustration of planning, permits, building, all of that. So I feel for these guys that they're working and, and, and that there was a change a, a, in job order, if you would, and to make things happen. But there, the issue is, is once he lost, once... Turn this on here. Got that. That is. See, right now, this is effective. I'm being very effective because I can speak to you. But it's while I am, I'm talking to you, amen, and I'm being effective, this here goes to the ground. Now, I'm not effective. You see where I'm going here? Amen. So now all I got is a stick. 
<laughs> and I can't, I can't make it do anything because I've lost the effective part of it. So now I become a professional wood bopper. <laughs> you follow where I'm going? Amen. So, so it's important in life not to lose the edge you've got. Amen. The power of God in your life. Amen. And he yelled out, I've, I've lost the accent. Effectiveness means producing or adapted to producing the proper result. When he lost that, he, the man didn't lose the whole axe. He just lost the head. He lost the effective part. With a stick, you can cut. I mean, excuse me, with a stick, I can't cut. I, I become a thumper. You're just swinging. If it doesn't mean anything to you, you're not going to say anything about it. It meant something to him. He didn't want to go through life just hitting with a stick. He wanted that axe head back, so he, he decried. He meant it's, it's borrowed. It's in the water. You know, and when there are times I understand this, guys. I don't believe uh, you can lose your salvation as easy as some people think. Now, I am saying I, don't, I wouldn't take the chance. Theologically, I would not take the chance. I know there are people that believe that no matter what, you're not going to lose it. But here's the thing is, you can lose the effective part of your life. Amen. You can lose that, the thing that, that, makes, that brings the joy in your life. I meet people that are telling me they're saved, but they have no joy. They look like they've been sucking on persimmons. Yeah, I don't know. Y all, y all, y all, some of y'all are in the city. Y'all don't know persimmons. But you know, Donald, you know what a persimmon is. I mean, we had a persimmon tree out behind, uh, down in front by Granny's house between us and Granny. And we'd go down there, man, we'd get them persimmons. Oh, my goodness. Persimmons, when they're ripe, are the most wonderful little fruit that God could give you. I don't know if it's a fruit or a vegetable. I don't want to look it up. I don't care. <laughs> but if you ever get hold of a green persimmon, it will, do, it will contort your face into something. You think lemons are bad. I'm telling you, get hold of a green persimmon and let that thing work on you. Amen. Punish your kids with it. <laughs> it's effective. I promise you. Don't ask me how I know. But what happens is people lose their effective, they lost their joy, amen, the, the excitement, you lose your witness, you lose the anointing, the unction to do, to go after things. You can't disregard the warning of a loose axe head in your life. Every now and then you got to check your head and make sure it's on good. Can I get an amen? Everybody kind of move your head just a little bit, just a little bit. Amen. Make sure your head's on right. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. You, you do it. Not me. Don't look at me to examine you. i got to check me all the time. But you examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? Test yourself. Do you still have a love for God? Do you still like to worship? Do you still like to read the Word of God? Do you still like to witness and share your witness with other people? These are tests in your life. And sometimes we go through it and we say to ourselves, you know, I don't need prayer. I don't need the Word. I don't, I, and you just start drifting. I'm saved. Once saved, always saved. Amen. I'm always going to go. Listen. You got to test yourself because what happens is you may go through life like a stick with no effectiveness to you. Because when I get ready to speak to people, yesterday when I stood in that pulpit, I had to speak to people I did not know. When it was over, people asked me to move to their town to become their pastor. Can I tell you something? You can't take me out of this town and the town that I'm in and go to another town, at least at this place in my life, I would lose my effectiveness. you got to make sure God gives you the green light to go. Can I get an amen? And so then I tell them, why don't you just drive to this church? Come on. Can I get an amen? Church alive? Yeah, it is. All the way from Katy. Come on over. Hallelujah. So test yourself. And this is important. Maybe this week, I, I pray not only you test yourself, but God would test you to see if you still got the faith to believe, to stay on it. To, to, you know, God, I, 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 want, I want to hear your voice. I want to hear your voice. When you lose the spiritual things in your life, when the pressure from the outside exceeds the pressure on the inside, there will be an implosion. There will be a collapse. Now, I know, Cheryl, you, you questioned some of my writings here. We need spiritual power to handle the pressure. If you would, a regulator. I learned that a regulator is important on a hot water heater. Because if that hot water heater builds up too much heat in there, and it doesn't have a pop-off valve, huh, John? You, you're going to have an explosion. Amen. You're going to have a problem. And there are people in this house, your pop-off valve is your anger issue. What you doing? I mean, you just blow up and get mad. That's not the will of God in your life. The regulator comes from worship. Couldn't wait to get here this morning just to worship. 
Amen. Because worship and prayer is like a regulator in my life. Amen. Well, I can begin to release the pressures that are on me. Amen. As I move through life, people say, well, it's, you seem like to make, you make life easy, Pastor. You do what you do look easy. It's not easy. But because I have to regulate it. There are times I, too, want to blow my stack. Right. You have to Google that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Amen. You, you get mad. You get upset. But you've got to regulate. And as believers in Christ, I sure don't want to vomit on you or blow up on you or lose my witness. Come on. Amen. So I have to regulate this thing to keep me from exploding. i got to take care of the pressure. The pressure is not bad. The pressure is what made me who I am. The pressure is what makes a woman who she is. The pressure is what makes a man who he is. Amen. As we move toward Father's Day, there are certain pressures that make you, Dad, who you are. But you've got to be careful. David, I don't know how you did it the last four days. Amen. He said grace. Grace is a tremendous regulator. Amen. Let me tell you something else. Grace and help. Amen. Other people helping out. We need one another. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So when the, when the loss came is when he was working. It was during a time of growth. Amen. It had fallen into the lake there or into the river. Hallelujah. And because of that, the, it was during a time. And it's when you're trying to do something, when you're trying to be effective, usually when the head comes off. And I have heard people say, oh, he lost his head. Right. They lost their head. Cop pulled him over and he lost his head. Uh -uh. It's in the midst of service. It's in the middle of swinging, which usually causes everybody else. It's funny. Everybody else stops at that moment to see what's happening. It, it, it always happens there. It's like when you're trying to be the most effective, and, and all of a sudden the axe head comes off. Last week in second service, we get to the end. We had that real spiritual moment, and I decided I'm going to sing. And I forgot the song that we were singing, but I started singing it. And as I go, Joseph, you remember that? And I started singing, and Ramirez is behind the piano there. And, but Ramirez doesn't have a mic. And so I'm singing the song. And it's that, you bet, you could feel God rush into that room. It was that the, the anointing was there, the Spirit of God was there. People were crying. And I'm, I'm going through it. I'm singing the song the best I can. And all of a sudden, I forgot the words. I felt like the axe head flew right off. <laughs> and everybody was looking right at me. And you know what I had to do at that moment, Ed? I had to own it. Amen. All I was doing was just a swinging, but I wasn't doing any good anywhere else. Amen. That was the end of the service at that moment. Don't laugh. It happens to you, too. You become a handle man. Amen. You're just a handle. We have the ability, but we've lost the anointing. Amen. We've beat on spiritual trees We've with polished hickory handles. I've gone. I have gone to strategy conferences on how to perfect the swing. <laughs> how to motivate wood boppers. The problem is the trees aren't fallen. The harvest is not gathered. Let me tell you, there have been times in my life that I understood that I didn't lose the handle. I didn't lose that the handles the ability. I didn't lose my knowledge. I understood the Bible. I could tell you where Scripture was. We, we could have continued in the motions, but we had never added anything to the building. And sometimes in the church world, we just go through the motions, but we're not doing it. We're not adding to the building. Amen. We're not adding to the lives of people. People aren't being changed. So it's important to keep the axe head. Can I get an amen? Our effectiveness comes from the Spirit. Zechariah 4, 6 says, It's not by might. It's not by power, but by my spirit. It's not by my ability. It's the Spirit of God. It's borrowed. What I have in me, the effectiveness I have. And I can stand up and say, oh, well, it's, it's my charisma. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's my, uh, let's be honest. The anointing that you and I carry is borrowed. The Holy Ghost came into your life for a reason. Amen. To give you, to make you more effective in, in life, to help you out. When Mary and Martha invited Jesus over to eat, and Martha's in the kitchen, she has ability. Martha has the handle, but my friend, Mary had the axe head. She sat at his feet. You know who was not? I told you last week, Mary was not supposed to be at his feet. First, because she's a woman. Second, they, you can't eat with the men. Third, the next thing is she pulled her hair down, let it down. But also, it, to sit at the feet of a rabbi, and Jesus was a rabboni. They called him rabbi. To sit at his feet was only for the men to get to do. But Jesus opened the door for women. Are you hearing me? I mean, we talk about uh, uh, equal uh, rights and all this other stuff. Nobody was more for women than Jesus. And yet they missed it. They missed it over and over. So he allowed her to sit there. Sometimes uh, we get this idea that our axe head has everything to do with doing. 
You are a human being. As I get older, I realize I can't do what I used to do. But I can be grandpa. I can be daddy. I can be husband. I can be friend. I can be brother. Amen. I can be. And in just being, sometimes the anointing is there. And I think that's important to know in life. Amen. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for, H, as we ought. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There are times the Spirit of God will move into your life. It is your infirmities. You, don't, you know, uh, my daughter fell the other day. She fell off a ladder and cracked a rib. Katie did. And uh, she said, I emptied it. I said, you what? She said, I, go- I emptied it. I went online and I Googled what was wrong with me. <laughs> so as she's chasing that, it's scaring her. Because she found out you could have a dislocated rib. Huh? So now she's nervous and to the point she, had, she went to the doctor to get an x-ray to tell her what she already knew. Which says that there's nothing you can do for a broke rib. Which I told her, nothing you can do about a big toe breaks. And nothing you can do about a rib. But she, she, she followed through with that. That was, her, that was her thing. The Holy Ghost looks inside you and understands your infirmities. He sees your need. He sees your heart condition, your mind, amen, your plumbing, and your electricity. He knows about you. So when you pray, understand this. God is working in you. Amen. He's doing things in you. He's being effective in you. He's producing proper results. So, Pastor, how do I recover our effectiveness? First, you've got to confess your loss. He did it. Hey, I lost I lost that. First off, everybody know you lost it. Everybody saw you lose your head. You blew up and you said words that you ain't said in years. Amen. Your actions show me you lost something. You can't just, you can keep hitting a piece of wood with a piece of wood, but you're not being effective. Everybody sees it. You might as well confess it. Come on. I lost my action. I've lost the anointing. I've lost my joy. I've lost my excitement. I've lost this passion in my life. So he lost it. And then he said, well, where did you lose it? In other words, return back to where you lost it. Revelation 2 says, yet I hold you uh, this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Wow. What are you saying here, Jesus? What I'm telling you is there's times that you walk with God, and as you walk with God, you started going away from me, further away from me. And as you did, what I need you to do is go back to your first love. Go back to where you lost it. Forty years ago, over 40 years ago, I became a believer in Christ. And I, 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 I this and you my memories. My memories of all night spontaneous prayer meetings. We didn't plan them. We just gathered as, as four teenagers uh, or early 20-year-olds who got together to pray, and we prayed all night. We, did, we didn't do it on purpose. I mean, there was even a female in the room. It could have been looked at as something bad. We didn't care. We prayed all night. We prophesied over one another. You know, say, well, you say, oh, yeah, we just prophesy. You know, God, give me a word. I got a word for you. Amen. We'd say it. We didn't know. We were young. We just we was young. And we, we worshiped. We didn't, have, we didn't have the lights. We didn't have the smoke. We didn't have the music that you got today. I love our worship music today. We didn't have that. But we worshiped. We just worshiped. We, 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 we carried our Bibles to work with us. Amen. We witnessed to people. I led people to Christ at, at Sonic. I led people to Christ at, at RC Cola. I go back. I got caught praying with the Pepsi guy. Almost got fired over that one. Amen. But, but my life was so full of passion for Christ. So I remember that. In 40 years, I go back and I look at that and I slap myself spiritually and I say, Hey, wake up, man. You, you got the handle down. You're a professional preacher. You've preached all over the world. People have heard you. They want to hear you again. But if you're not careful, you lose the anointing. You lose the sharpness. You lose the ability to see things fall and get done. Come on. And I don't want to pastor people that just go through the motion. And you don't want a pastor that just goes through the motion. Amen. I quit wearing suits and ties a long time ago. Because I felt like the suit and tie gave me that impression that I had arrived. Right. Amen. I'd rather just be comfortable. <laughs> if I got to swing this axe, I ain't doing it in no suit and tie. Hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get after this thing. So it's important to understand that everybody here 
has an ability, has an anointing, has, has, it's borrowed from God. God saved you. Yes, you're going to heaven. Amen. But before you get there, can you help us all become more effective? Amen. Can we reach more people for Jesus? Can, can we, can we have, show the joy of the Lord? Amen. Because they say, well, well, you know, the band sounds like a bunch of men up there singing. Amen. What's that matter? It doesn't matter to me. I was walking the property yesterday. I was listening to a song, uh, Maverick City Music, old time, old something basement. And it was about, and it just brought back memories to me that I remember the day that I gathered with, with young people and we just worshiped. You know, the pastor didn't have to call a special meeting. We just did it. Amen. Hey, we just got together. We just, we just hung out. We weren't trying to hurt nobody, split no churches, anything like that. We just shows for Jesus rally. Muscle shows for Jesus. Hey, Amen. They were powerful. Muscle shows for Jesus. The town I'm from, the hit recording capital of the world where Scannard was and Almond Brothers were in Aretha Franklin. Hey, Amen. Uh, uh, where they sang their music. It places filled with great music. Shows for Jesus. We would gather. We would have rallies. Hey, Amen. We would pack churches out. We'd preach the gospel. We'd sing. I was up there with a friend I led to Christ named Cecil Staggs. He was a Q Klux Klan chaplain. <laughs> How do you know somebody got to be the chaplain for the Q Klux Klan? <laughs> led him to Jesus. His wife used to chase me when I worked at the Sonic. Led him to Christ. Big guy, man. I'm sitting up in the balcony at shows for Jesus rally at some big Baptist church downtown. Amen. I'm up there with Cecil. He just, just got born again. Amen. He's, I tell him about Christ. He's denounced his, his racist ways and all the meanness he had toward, toward any blacks. And who's preaching? But a skinny little black man in a suit. Come on. He's preaching the gospel. And I'm watching Cecil, and I'm thinking to myself, Dear God, please don't let this go down like I think it's fitting to. <laughs> and Cecil, hearing the gospel preached by that man, and all of a sudden he come running out of the balcony. He man turned the altar call. He's running out. I'm chasing Cecil down the aisle. I think I'm going to have to jump on him before he jumps that black preacher. And right before he gets out, he falls on his knees, looks up at that black man with tears in his eyes, and repents for ever being racist. My friend, that's what I'm talking about. Going back into a day in your life where you remember what Jesus did for you. And when that happens, you go back to where you lost it. Where did I lose the gospel? Where did I lose my passion? Where did I lose that? Amen. That's where I need to get back to. The branch, he threw a stick in and the iron popped up out of the water and it began to swim. Amen. As it moved toward him. It was an amazing, I call it God's will. And so he said, well, I can't go back to that. Uh, uh, that, does, uh, that was before I was proper. <laughs> My friend, the gospel has never been proper. The gospel has changed people's lives forever. When I think of Saul, who was there, and he had a writ on his, that the boy Stephen had been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's had his death warrant, and he brought people together, and he incited a riot. And they began to take their, their clothes, their coats off, and they laid them at the feet of Saul. Amen. They put them at his feet to show that he was responsible for this moment. And they took stones, and they stoned that 16-year-old, 17-year-old teenager who loved Jesus. Amen. And there's a stone in him and hitting him with stones. He looks up toward heaven, and he said, I see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. And then he says the most powerful thing, and you have to read the prayer in the book of Acts. He says, do not lay this against them. How is it that we hate people for their beliefs and how we begin to turn against people who've loved you? The, the world hates you. The world hates the church. The world has enmity. It's an enemy to the church. The reason why, it isn't that we hate the world. We love the world. The world hates you. The world hates you because you love Jesus. It's just, uh, if you've missed this yet, you, you've missed the whole thing. The whole paradigm of heaven and earth is this fight of good and evil. Amen. There's no other way to light and darkness. That there is a Satan out there. There is an enemy that is turning the world against itself. He's involved in our schools and all the political uprisings and all those things. And if you can't look and see behind the veil of the enemy that we're dealing with, and Paul was there, Saul, at that time, and he allowed them, but something, I, I, I have to believe, it changed his life forever to see that teenager get stoned to death and to say, Father, forgive them. I told my pastor this morning, I said, I don't know, I'm, I'm not there. 
I'm not there where I could be like a Stephen to look at the people that are hitting me with rocks. You know, shoot me. Put me out of my, but to hit me with rocks until I'm dead. And you know how bad aim some people are. They're going to hit you in the kneecap and in the elbow and they're going to miss your head over and over again. Put me out of my, but not at that moment he said, Father, forgive them. You know what he's doing? He was emulating his Lord. Amen. He said, this is what, that's anointing. That is passion. That, and that changed Paul's life. His name later became known as Paul, and he remembered, and he even said it. I had the writ in my hand. I had the paperwork in my hand to kill Christians. Amen. That's what I did. And that's why Paul was so passionate toward Christ. You know when you've been forgiven much, you love much? Have you forgotten how much you've been forgiven? Have you remembered the stuff you've done in life that nobody else knows, and you pray to God there's not a, uh, when we get to heaven, there'll be a playback of it? I have. That's my prayer. I don't know how you pray, but that's how I pray. God, erase it, please. Delete, delete, delete. Me past, delete me past, delete me past. Amen. He had the writ in his hand. It reminded him. And then Paul later said, I press on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting, deleting my past, I press on. Let me start closing. Iron did swim. The iron did swim. The iron did swim. I call it God's ridiculous principle. It's, this is ridiculous. You can't throw a stick in the water. If I throw a stick in the water, I just lost my stick and the axe head. Now I done lost it all. He said, throw it in. Throw the stick in. Threw it in. Jeremiah 32, 27. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Question. It's not rhetorical. You answer it. Answer it. Not too hard for you. Then why do we act like it? There's nothing too hard for you. When I said with Pat yesterday, I realized this is God's ridiculous principle. <laughs> you shouldn't even be here, Pat. Here you are up here talking to me. Is anything too difficult for me? Amen. Put your situation. Is it too hard, declares the Lord? A teenager kills a giant with a sling and a stone. It's ridiculous. Two million people march through a Red Sea. Redi march through a Red Sea? That's ridiculous. Hungry lions refuse to eat an old prophet. Ridiculous. Four men walking in a fiery furnace. Ridiculous. Axe head swimming? Amen. How about an army marches around the city in silence for a week, then shouts in the walls? Fall. That's ridiculous. Little boy sack lunch feeds 5,000 men plus women. That's ridiculous. Son of God. Dies, buried, resurrected. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. How do I stay effective? How do I stay effective? First, honesty. Be honest. It first takes hard work. You got to work. You can't, you can't sit back. You got to work. Then honesty. I lost it. I lost it. Why did I lose my passion? I got to remind myself it was borrowed. I got to be thankful it was borrowed. You ever borrowed something from somebody and they said, now listen, don't you lose it. <laughs> Matter of fact, my initials are on there. PJ, Pastor Jerry, they on there. Don't lose it. Don't lose my stuff. It was borrowed. God loaned you his spirit. He going to take it back when he takes you back. Home, where did you lose? Go back home. My, my walk with God, if, you know, every time I get pulled over by a police officer, I think to myself, Lord, you're giving me an opportunity. Where did that start? It started in 1979 on my way to the mall before it closed in my 72 Dodge Charger. A cop pulled me over. He said, son, oh. Well, you know you're speeding? I said, yes, sir. I got to get to the mall. This is how, this is how. I said, I got to get to the mall. They're selling these Jesus shirts. Come on. <laughs> I got to get one. You know, you just couldn't order it online like you can get your Holy Wild shirt online. You had to go to the mall to get it. They're selling these Jesus shirts at the mall. I, I need, I got to get me a Jesus shirt, man. And he said, you know why I pulled you over? I said, I was speeding. He said, yeah. He said, uh. But three, I pulled you over. You got a headlight out, son. I said, I can fix that real quick. And I jumped up, popped the hood on my car, and got under there, and I wiggled it, and the light came back on. 
And he said, well, you better hurry. Get to the mall. Gave me a warning. Slow down. But I remember my passion was so strong. I had to tell him about I got I got to tell you why I'm doing it. I'm not going to lie to you, sir. Hey, man, I'm going to go get me a Jesus shirt. I just want people to know that I love Jesus. Go back home. Go back to where you lost it. And then hilarity. Sometimes you just got to laugh. <laughs> That's funny. Three men go into the furnace. There's four walking around. One looks like Jesus. Old man thrown into a lion's den. They, they won't eat him. But then whatever you throw in after that, they eat it before it ever hits the ground. God, that's hilarious. I want my, and you need to write these down. You need to catch them. Amen. You need to get hold of them. Be hard work, honesty, Holy Ghost, home, hilarity. Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. He does the things others cannot do. That's right. Come on. Whew. People tend to underestimate who they are and what they have in God. Again, Ephesians 1, 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power. Exceedingly effective. Exceedingly effective. The word exceedingly effective means to throw beyond the usual mark. In other words, you used to throw a football 30 yards. But all of a sudden, through prayer and hard work, you're throwing it 40. You're throwing it beyond the normal mark. Amen. To excel, to pass, to leap forward. Which of us, when we were young, saw the men walking on the moon? And when we saw their first step, we thought to ourselves, man, I'd love to do that. And we saw them bounce. And it wasn't just a step. It was a leap. They, I mean, they, they went. And then we got these... Uh, these places now you can go where it has that same effect where you, you feel no gravity and you're able to leap and to move forward exceedingly, abundantly above what you've ever done before. You were able to move further. You went faster. Amen. It was a result. Now unto him, Ephesians 3.20. Let's, let's finish where we started. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Stand with me. Everybody say leap. leap. Say it again. Leap. You know, being a young man with a fused foot, I'm unable to leap. I can do a honky hop. But I can't do no great big leaps. I've envied people that can run fast, you know. And had to get over that sin. But my prayer, my prayer is that you understand that God will do exceedingly abundantly above all you can think or ask. And sometimes I think we, we think too little and we ask too little. Amen. So we got to ask big. God, you know, I'm going to tell you, from where I came from 40-something years ago to where I'm at today, it's been a leap. It's been a leap. And every now and then it was a stop. And I had to get back home. I had to remind myself my first love. And I had to start over again and test myself. You test yourself. But my prayer is that God will accelerate the progress of growth in every area of our lives. Everybody say leap. leap. My prayer is to move forward daily in our maturity in Christ. Come on, say it. Leap. leap. Amen. This year I'm praying you move up to a high class of living. Leap. My prayer is your dreams come to pass earlier than later than you anticipated. Leap. Amen. This will be a year of increase. Amen. The provision for your vision will be provided this year. One of the greatest revelations I had is wherever there's vision, there's provision. Then it takes supervision. Beware of division. Because if you do, you've got to have revision. Woo, preach, preach it. God is hastening the process of our purpose to bring about the desired end. Amen. I pray you stay effective. As you take this message to heart. As much as I enjoy preaching it. Just for a moment, would you close your eyes? Would you go back to that place in your mind to where you first met him? The joy of the Lord in your life, the excitement of knowing that no matter what happens to you, heaven is your home, and you'll be with the loved ones of the past. Would you go back in your life and remember when you prayed, when God gave you miracles? Amen. You saw things that... You're not even talked about them. You, you need to share it. 
God's been so good, so, so good. Amen. And now would you just put your hands together and honor him with a praise. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. Honor him with praise. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless you in this house. We love you. God, take us back to our first love. Amen. Give us our sharpness again. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I pray your hearts as stirred as mine is this morning. Y'all made me sweat. <laughs> Which is good, Kenny. It's good to sweat. Amen. Be seated for a brief moment. Reach to the front. Grab you a tithe and offer an envelope. Honor God this morning with your giving. Amen. Being effective. I just want to be effective. And let me say this again. Sometimes it's not in the doing. It's just in the being. I just want to be where you are, Lord. Here, here's an old song. You don't know this one. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place. I forget the rest of the song. I think it's okay sometimes to forget it or not remember it. I look them up. I look them up. Because, I, again, I go back to the days of Larry Norman. That song was a guy named Andre Crouch. Amen. Take me back. You know, we had some good music back. They got good music today, too. But my music meant everything to me. I still love Skinner. The Almond Boys, I would love all that good music. But then every now and then I go back and I, I pull up some of that gospel. I mean, Brian Duncan. Mm, amen. I, I pull up some music from Sweet Comfort Band and Rez Band. And I, I just got to listen to it. When I hear it, it just does something to me. Amen. I love it. It, it affects your life. It brings you back. How I many know your music brings you back? You hear me? Some of y'all, y'all hear an old Conway Twitty song, you start crying. I do too. I couldn't stand him. I started crying as soon as I hear him. God. <laughs> you know, my mama liked him, you know. Twitty City. Hallelujah. And, uh, but, but music does that to you. I mean, that's why I like Johnny Cash and Waylon Jennings and stuff. It brings me back. It brings me back to where I was. Just some good old boys. Hey, Amen. I'd watch the Dukes of Hazard get in my Dodge Charger. Next thing you know, I'm sliding down the country road sideways. <laughs> music always brought me back. It, it was part of my hot rod days, man. You know, so I love music. But then there's that gospel side of me. I got to hear that music. When I hear it, it just does something. It reminds me of the goodness of God in the land of the living. Amen. Amen. Be a good giver this morning. Be a good giver. Honor the king with your giving. If you're new in this church, press in. How do you become a member? Show up, pray up, and give up. That's it. Show up, pray up, and give up. I got a letter last week in the mail. It was from somebody's church. They joined our church, and uh, I got a letter from their old church. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it. They said, Pastor, they sent a letter saying this person is good for you. To, for, uh, that's nice. But I don't, if you leave here and go somewhere else, I'm not sending your, your new pastor a letter. I may call him and warn him, but I'm not going to send him a letter. Amen. Come on up here. Hey, Amen. Give it up for your pastor. All right. I think he.